Good evening. Good evening. It is good to be in the Lord's house with you here tonight and rejoice in his mercy and grace. Uh, today in our reading in, in Genesis and in our, our gospel reading in Matthew, or Mark, uh, we have some, some comments about relationships and marriage. And so we're going to talk about those things in our worship today. With that in mind, let's sing our opening hymn. I said that we'll be talking about family relationships a little bit. Well, our opening hymn is Children of the Heavenly Father. Let's sing with great joy. Ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God. We confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Friends, rejoice in the good news. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your renown, O Lord, throughout all, throughout all ages. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Give praise to the servants of the Lord. Who stand in the house of the Lord in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing to your name, Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your renown, O Lord, throughout all ages. For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. Glory be 
to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your renown, O Lord, throughout all ages. Brothers and sisters, the Lord be with you. And Let us pray. Merciful Father, your patience and loving kindness toward us have no end. Grant that by your Holy Spirit we may always think and do those things that are pleasing in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the reading of God's holy word. somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. He who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one origin. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation I will sing your praise. And again I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, 
I and the, and the children God has given me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise in honor of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Pharisees came up in order to test Jesus, asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, Because of the hardness of your heart he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And in the house the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant, and he said to them, Let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. We now confess our faith together. I believe in one God, the Father only, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, the begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated as we sing hymn 861.
to the family of God gathered here at beautiful Savior Lutheran Church, and to all of you wherever you are, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is going to be from both Genesis 2 and Mark chapter 10. And today we'll keep this theme in mind, relationships restored. I'm going to skip any clever introductions and tell you we're just going to jump right in as we talk about relationships in general and marriage in particular. We're going to have three sections. God's good design. Two, the corruption of creation. And three, relationships restored in the kingdom of God. God's good design, the corruption of creation, relationships restored in the kingdom. So first, God's good design. As we heard this reading in Genesis chapter 2, we heard this verse. It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Now, if you're reading from page one of the Bible, the very beginning, Genesis chapter one, and you read up to this point, you've heard the account of creation. God speaks and he says, let there be, and it is created. Light, sky and sea, the, the land and all the plants, the sun and moon and stars, the fish and the fowl, and then all the animals on the land, and last of all, man. And we hear this refrain, in Genesis chapter 1, and God saw that it was good, and it was good, it was good, repeats over and over. And then, after God made a human male and a human female, both in his own image, that is, like him, in, in holiness and perfection, creatures that are now the crown of creation, intelligent, amazing, incredible. Well, after he makes them, then the Bible tells us it was very good. And then God rests on the seventh day. Well, then in Genesis chapter 2, we take a magnifying glass over day 6. And we see that day again, but now with more detail. And then this verse in our reading sticks out. It was not good that the man should be alone. We were made for community, we were made to be with others. And so it was not good yet because God wasn't done yet. He had something amazing and incredible left to do. He makes a woman to be with the man. He said that he would make her to be a fit helper. And you should know that this is not derogatory in any way. In fact, the word helper is a word that is applied even to God himself in Scripture, like in Psalm 70, verse 5. But I am poor and needy. Hasten to me, O God. You are my helper, my deliverer. O Lord, do not delay. So this helper, this female helper, this ally, this partner for man is fit for him and then emphasizes her complementary nature she's different from him but equal to him in value in intelligence she's also made in the image of god and she is far greater than all the animals that adam saw paired up male and female as he named them all so God takes part of man's side. We often call it a rib. That's actually our best guess is what the, the Hebrew word there means. But God takes that part of uh, his side and he, and he makes a woman. He literally builds a woman out of it and brings her to the man. In the Hebrew, the words for man and woman are, are similar. They're related. Man is ish and woman is isha. Just how our words for man and woman are related to. The complementary nature of male and female is preserved from our most ancient languages all the way up to our present languages. As a species, we are binary. And up until the last few years, Every culture and every language and every scientist and every person of faith has affirmed that. But not now. 
Uh, we'll, we'll get to that. Man and woman were husband and wife. And they were not ashamed of their nakedness because there was nothing to be ashamed of. Neither one was ashamed of their own body nor ashamed for their spouse because there was no judging, no distrust, no ridicule, no embarrassment, no dislike or hate for the way that God made them. Nothing like that. And that's not exactly how we function today, is it? Why not? We'll get to that. But Moses tells us, this is verses 24 through 25 in Genesis 2. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And so from creation up to Moses' day and then up to Jesus' day and then even up to our day, we see that a man and a woman, well, they speak pledges to one another and often also to God. And they keep those vows to be faithful to each other until death parts them. That's marriage, the union of a man and a woman for life. That's God's beautiful creation, his incredible design. And we, when we live in that beautiful design for gender, sexuality, marriage, and intimacy, we then are happier and healthier and blessed. Blessed and, and we are blessings to others. You see, marriage is the fundamental building block of the family as children are produced. And marriage is also the fundamental building block, therefore, of all society. And you, whether you are married or not, whether it has gone well for you or not, it is good for you to strive now to uphold this design, to honor marriage, to pray for husband and wife, to uplift and uphold this design as good and holy. In fact, we often call it holy matrimony in the church, right? So that's the design. But as I already pointed out, we're not functioning perfectly, are we? So now we talk about the second section, the corruption of creation. God's good design, the corruption of creation is now point two. We're not going to take the time to read Genesis chapter 3 now, but, but if you're not familiar with it, you should read it this week. If you are familiar with it, you know about how Satan came to tempt and how Eve and also Adam, who was right there with her, broke God's commandment. They sinned against God's will and they acted out against God's design. They partook of something that was not for them and they plunged all of creation into corruption. That's the fall, as we call it, right? The fall from grace, the fall from glory, the fall from God's good design, the fall far from the beauty and blessing that had been in the perfection of Eden. And so it is that up until Moses' day and up through Jesus' day and even up to our day, relationships, are ruined by sin. We can talk about marriage in particular, particular, but all relationships in general are ruined by sin. Even, even each of us individually, internally, as we often ponder our own identity, we can get mixed up. All of us are tainted by sin. We're broken. Some examples. Someone feels like they're the wrong gender or someone is wandering and confused in a non-binary wasteland, or someone feels attraction for the same sex instead of the opposite, like most, or siblings scream and argue with each other, or a man takes advantage of a woman, or a woman cheats on a husband, or a man doesn't want to pay for a child and help raise it, so he pays for an abortion instead. Or a husband and wife are committed to each other for life, but they fight too much. Or he's lazy. Or she's selfish. Or a boy is addicted to pornography. Or a girl hates herself because everyone on Instagram seems better than her. Humans are trafficked. Children are abused. And all of that 
All of that is exactly what Satan wants for every one of us and for everyone on the planet. He wants us all trapped there. And it's not that every family has every kind of brokenness, but you can be sure every family has some kind of brokenness. Now, I want to emphasize that there is hope for every single person in every single example that I gave, every scenario I mentioned, because no problem is too trivial for Christ to care about, nor too traumatic for his healing to help. And so if you, you hear a list like the one I just gave and you say, oh no, I'm really messed up. Friends, do not despair. There is hope. And there is always help. And we're going to get to more of that. But it's because of this brokenness then that the Pharisees come up to test Jesus in Mark chapter 10. And it's more than a test. It's, it's a temptation. It's a trap. And they say, Jesus, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Well, the answer is clearly yes. There are provisions in the law of Moses for it. But Jesus doesn't want to say, okay, here's how to get divorced. Now, in other places in scripture, Jesus will allow someone to get divorced if their, their spouse was unfaithful to them. And in another place in scripture, St. Paul does not hold someone to their marriage vows if, if uh, their spouse just up and left, abandoned them. And in the church, we consider abuse to be either a form of abandonment or unfaithfulness, and we don't ask anyone to stay in an abusive situation. But in this interaction here, Jesus' goal isn't to say, okay, here's how to get divorced, but to rather to say, this is marriage. This is the design. This is the intent. And he wants to point that out because it is so hard for us humans to get it. So, Jesus points out to them that lawful divorce, divorce really ought to be the exception rather than the rule. It's not the way it's supposed to be. And in fact, in Mark 10, then Jesus quotes from Genesis chapters 1 and 2, and he says, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Now it's important to see here that Jesus is himself is affirming our first point about how God created and designed things to be including male and female and marriage. And then by extension, we can talk about family and friends and society. It is also important to note that Jesus here isn't just affirming God's good design, but Jesus is actively working to bring about a restored creation, a new creation. And this brings us to our third section, then. Relationships restored in the kingdom. Friends, you actually see this restoration in what Jesus does next. He welcomes the little children to him. Now, we talked about that just a couple weeks ago. We, we said that children were needy, they're dependent, they're weak, they're vulnerable, and let's not forget that they are also broken, sinful, and selfish, just like adults. But what does Jesus say? He says, let the children come to me. And then he encourages all of us to receive what God has to offer, just like little children willingly receive whatever is given to them. We are to receive the kingdom of God through Jesus. And in this kingdom of God, grace is given to heal and to restore. We are remade 
in the image of God. And we are given again that holiness that had been lost. We are taught to walk in God's will for our lives. And in that good design, we find peace. And by the power of the Spirit, He changes you already now. You do not have to wait for that last day when He comes again to have this gift. Okay, now that last day... Let's talk about that for a second. That's going to be a great day, right? When he comes again, a beautiful day, the beginning of our eternity of peace. Think about that perfection for a moment. No more identity crises. No more lust. No more adultery. No more pain. No more arguments. No more fighting. No more wars. No more betrayal. No more broken hearts. No more feelings of abandonment or loneliness. Just Joy, worship, laughter, peace, love, the family of God, games, music, work, but only the kind that's enjoyable and, and always fruitful. Lord, bring this day to us, right? Do you want that? Do you want that? You do not have to wait. Oh, of course, yes, you have to wait for perfection. It's not going to be perfect here and now. But right now, Christ is working in you, working to restore you, working to restore your relationships, working to wash away your sin and to fill you with his spirit to make you new again. God's grace is at work to give you life already now because of the restorative power of Jesus' perfect life and his sacrificial death and his glorious resurrection. Because Jesus paid for your sin. Jesus suffered your curse. And Jesus is transforming your pain. So do not despair. No matter what your brokenness is here. Because he helps you. Past, present, and future, you can give it all to him. Your past, anything that was good there, health, healthy relationships, family, friends, every blessing was all built and given by God. But everything bad there in your past, all the hurt, all the shame, all the guilt, give it to Jesus. He can forgive, he can help, he can heal. Give him also your present because he promises to be present in your present and you need his grace and his power right now, today, and each day. And give him also your future. His will be done because his will is always good. You can trust him to guide you, to direct you, give you all wisdom and strength and you will see relationships restored in the kingdom. And it happens through things that seem common and ordinary. A simple remembrance of baptism, sign of the Holy Cross, a daily affirmation that you are a baptized child of God, loved and valued by him. It comes to you also in a time of prayer, prayer of confession and, and a scripture verse, a promise that reminds you of all that God does to forgive and restore you. It comes to you as a brother or sister in Christ, dries your tears and reminds you of God's unfailing love. It comes to you as a pastor, speaks authoritative words of absolution. It's given to you in a meal from God, given to you so that you know you are a welcome child of God, though you are sinful, God desires to give himself to you. And in this way, and friends, the devil does not want you to know this, but this is absolutely true and I've seen it. In these simple gifts, in these simple ways, individuals are restored and their relationships are restored. Some examples. A person learns to accept and live in the biological sex and gender that God gave them. A person learns discipline, to say no to lust, to wait for marriage, or to remain celibate. 
A husband learns to be patient and kind and selfless toward his wife. A wife learns to respect and honor and be an ally to her husband. A grieving husband learns to accept God's will and teaches young, young husbands to cherish their wives. A grieving widow learns to trust that God will care for her. An abuser learns repentance. A selfish family member learns selflessness from Christ. Husband and wife learn to talk through problems instead of fight. Siblings learn to apologize and forgive and enjoy each other. And on and on and on we could go. It happens. Right here, right now, that is Jesus at work. His spirit in you to forgive, to restore, to make you new. That is Jesus being your teacher, your helper, your friend, your life. That is Jesus being the bridegroom to take care of us, his bride. Because he is always faithful to his vows. Always loving, always giving himself, always giving grace. So, in some ways, Mark chapter 10 and Genesis chapter 2 can be tough texts because we've got tough problems. But Jesus isn't afraid to tackle any of your challenges. He's tougher than any problem you've got. So let's give it all to him and ask for his help. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, Listen now to the brokenness of my heart. Even the stuff I'm too embarrassed or afraid to tell anyone else. Lord, forgive. Restore, heal, and help. And you will, for you are my redeemer and the restorer of my relationships and the helper of my soul. Thank you. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which transcends understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let us now worship God and give thanks to him for all he has done for us as we give to him our offerings. In our prayers today, we'll pray for Samantha Coombs, recovering from ankle surgery and is undergoing rehab therapy. We'll pray for Holly Stewart as she recovers from surgery. We'll also pray for Donna Banish's uncle, Jim Schultze, who is hospitalized with serious health issues. We'll pray for Carter, the infant son of Christian and Caitlin Childs who has been discharged from the, uh, the neonatal intensive care unit and is now at home. We'll pray for Carter and for his parents as they adjust and transition to life at home. We'll pray for Pam Fowler, who fell on Sunday and has a compression fraction of her vertebrae. We'll pray for Norman Baldwin's neighbor, uh, who is uh, very sick with COVID, and for, for his wife, uh, the name is uh, Robert, and for others who remain on our prayer list. Let us rise for prayer. Thank <laughs> you.
Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. We pray for the church, that God's people live confidently and never neglect the salvation won by Jesus Christ, but joyfully share the message of salvation in word and deed. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the nations of the world, that the presence of Christ be experienced everywhere around the globe, and that the gospel message have free course in every land. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our families and for those who share in our Christian fellowship and join with us in worship. Grant that we never take them for granted, but help us to encourage the labors in which we work together for the glory of God. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those with special concerns and needs this day, those who are hospitalized or shut in, those who are grieving, the unemployed and underemployed, the chronically ill, and all those whose needs are, are not known to us. Today we pray especially for those who, whose needs are known to us. We pray for Samantha and Holly that they would recover well. We pray for Jim, Carter, Pam, Paul, Angela, Carol, Vince, Wayne, Matt, Rodney, Darren, Kim, Steve, Sandy, Nathan, Elwood, Paul, Marge, Robert, and his wife, all in their various health concerns, that you would strengthen, heal, and restore. We pray for Margaret, Donna, Teresa, Jana, Tim, and Lon as they fight cancer, that you would sustain them, give them peace, and grant healing. We pray for all those who are mourning broken relationships and all those mourning the loss of loved ones, that you would pour out your healing power on them to give them peace and comfort and help in time of need. We pray for all others that we now name in our hearts. And grant, O oh Lord, that we would bring your blessing to situations of need in all places. Lord, in your mercy. As we bring our prayers to you, O Lord, we remember the faithful Christians whose earthly lives have been completed and who are now in your eternal keeping. Help us to follow their examples of faith and faithfulness, and at the last, reunite us with them in the joy of your heavenly kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. These things and all else that we should have asked Grant to us with your blessing, for the sake of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created, and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Amen. O Lord Jesus. O, <clears throat> o Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn.